Welcome to this special briefing, our fourth Frontline Club virtual event. I'm Naomi Steer, National Director of Australia for UNHCR. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of lands right around Australia, and I pay my respects to their elders past and present. Thank you to everybody who's joining us uh, this afternoon. Uh, and in other parts, um, a very early morning, uh, as, as we have many friends and supporters across Australia and um, the world, I'm very happy to say. Uh, uh, I hope you are all safe and uh, well. The explosions that tore through Beirut at the beginning of August affected us all, particularly the vibrant Lebanese community uh, in Australia. And of course, as we're going to hear, um, refugees and, and the Lebanese uh, population um, on the ground. So I know uh, from our many friends and colleagues here, there's a deep interest in today's conversation, particularly as the region prepares for the threat of a, another bitter winter on top of everything else. I'd like to start with a special thanks and a warm welcome to our guests. Carolina Lindholm Billing, UNHCR's Deputy Representative in Lebanon, joining us from Beirut today. Hi, Carolina. Brett Moore, UNHCR's Global Chief of Shelter and Settlement, based normally in Geneva and joining us from Beirut today. Hi, Brett. And Raja Yassin, uh, a Crescent Foundation Ambassador, educator, social justice advocate, and a second generation Lebanese Australian joining us from Sydney today. Hi, Raja. This is what our Frontline Club is about, in person or online, connecting our supporters around Australia with those in the field, giving us a chance to hear firsthand what's happening on the ground. As we're going along, please feel free to enter your questions in the Q&A section. We will try to get to as many uh, as we can. If you're posting on social media, please also use the, use the hashtag Hashtag Frontline Club um, AU. So thanks very much. Our first uh, guest today, Carolina Lindholm Billings, has worked with the UN Refugee Agency for more than two decades, serving in Macedonia and the Baltic States, in Zambia and also in HQ in Geneva, before taking on the role as UNHCR's Deputy Representative uh, Protection in Lebanon in 2017. Uh, as some of us know, Lebanon is one of UNHCR's longest running operations with a history that goes back five decades, which is quite incredible when, when you think about it. Uh, roughly a quarter of the population today of Lebanon are refugees, and we're going to talk about the impact of um, the uh, current situation on their lives, but also on the host population, who has been incredibly uh, generous over the nine years of the uh, Syrian situation. It's a complex operation and obviously compounded by the devastating port explosions in, in August. Carolina, to you, can you describe uh, for us um, and paint a picture of what the political um, and social situation in Lebanon uh, is like uh, across the country at the moment? Thank you so much, Nomi, for your warm introduction and welcoming, and, and thank you very much for the opportunity to, to participate in this. So as you described, I mean, the situation in Lebanon, it's very fragile. It's a country that has faced crisis upon crisis and with the big explosion, the devastating explosion in the port on the 4th of August being like the last big drop or crisis that hit the country. So um, from the refugees perspective, I mean, with the start of the Syria conflict in 2011, um, it the first, uh, the refugees started arriving after, most arrived after a couple of years in the bigger numbers, but the conflict in Syria itself has had a very heavy economic toll on Lebanon with interrupted trade and, and tourism to Lebanon. So that already fragilized the country. And then a very deep economic crisis that hit uh, really hard in October last year, and led to countrywide protests over um, calling for more governance, transparency, and so on. Then the COVID situation with the lockdowns and, and loss of, of jobs that that means, and then the blast. So 
all this together is multiple crises compounding on each other, which has had an impact both on uh, very much on the political situation uh, where the government, we've had several governments resigning in the last year and currently a caretaker government and an economy in crisis with huge losses of jobs and uh, a high inflation and a devaluation of the Lebanese pound, which has led to you know, an exponential rise in prices. So all this together means that poverty has increased a lot across the board very much among the refugees, but also among Lebanese, as well as migrant workers who have lost their job, which means that there is now a lot of competition just for resources for survival. So overall, it's a very fragile situation, a very fragile context, both politically, structurally, and emotionally for people who feel that, um, many people feel they don't see you know, where, where this country is going and, and where their future lies. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. Um, I think we've got a map here uh, because I just wanted to, to look at um, UNHCR's operations uh, across Lebanon. Um, Lebanon is a country we're very familiar with in Australia, but I think um, we're not so familiar with its sort of pivotal geographic position and political position in the Middle East. So um, if we could put that up, if we have it. Just waiting. And while, while we're doing that, uh, Carolina, maybe you can talk more broadly uh, right now about UNHCR's yes. uh, operations um, across the country. Because what the map will show is how the Syrian refugees at, you know, there is, we estimate that there are around 1.5 million Syrian refugees in Lebanon who have arrived since the conflict started. And they are living dispersed across the country. So Lebanon does not have formal refugee camps, but people have settled in local communities and towns. And the majority in towns that were already very fragile and vulnerable and poor before the Syria conflict. And here people live side by side with the Lebanese population that has shown an incredible hospitality and, and you know, understanding for the people who had to flee the war. But of course, it also means that um, there is a lot of additional pressure on services and infrastructure. Um, it's, it's, you know, people using the same roads, the same waste collection, the same schools, um, health clinics, etc. And um, so um, UNHCR, we have four offices across the, the country, four field offices and one um, satellite office. And this is because we want to have our presence close to the field where the refugees are living in the host communities. So we have one up in the north in Tripoli, uh, one in Beirut that covers the Beirut Mount Lebanon region, one in the south in Tyr, and one in the Bekaa in Sakhle. And from these offices, we reach out to people. It, UNHR is very much, as you know well, it's a um, field operational organization that wants to work close to the people. So the, these dots that you see on the map, I don't know if you can see the whole map, but shows yeah. like the, the density of the population. So the fact that people are living really side by side next to each other um, has been very positive in many respects. It's not refugees in an isolated camp segregated from the community, but of course it also adds then pressure and tensions, especially in an environment like this when um, people are really just struggling for their daily survival. Yes, and we've got on, it doesn't show on the map, but on the west, as I understand, is the Mediterranean. And yes. Syria would um, be on the northwest, I guess. Yeah, it's the, really the surrounding. There. It's really north and then east of Lebanon. So it's really, I mean, it, it has border with, with, with Syria almost throughout the whole country. So when people fled to Lebanon, they came through different. In the beginning, it was through the north into Akkar, that region, which is a very, um, it's quite a poor, um, underdeveloped region where people then, you know, open their homes and their hearts to people and 
and, uh, and, and, and people settled in the, in the local communities. Mm -hmm. yeah. but also just, just on that, we can take the map now um, mm. down, thanks. But Carolina, when you start talking about, you know, those, those early years and the Lebanese community has been very welcoming and, and, and generous. Um, but I think like everybody hoping that the crisis uh, certainly would have been resolved long before now and, and into it, 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 it's nine years. What is the situation uh, like for refugees and what's the environment um, and the feeling among the local population now uh, about the large numbers of refugees uh, within Lebanon? I mean, both the refugees and, and, and you know, Lebanese, if I generalise, um, I think had expected the, the stay of, of the refugees to be shorter. That you know, the conflict in Syria would, would resolve faster and people would be able to return in safety and dignity. But with this protracted stay and, and, and prolonged exile, um, for, the, for the many of the refugees I speak with really say that one of the most challenging things over the years has been to keep, just keep hope, you know, and not lose hope. Because when you are, feel that you have very little visibility, of how the situation is developing and, and, and ability to plan for your and your children's future. For Lebanese, it's also with the um, economic crisis and, and people's loss of jobs and now the, the, the inflation and rise in prices and this just sheer yeah, competition for survival, that is making the situation very fragile. And we see tensions rising between um, communities and individuals as people are you know competing for the same jobs and uh, um, so i think what is there uh, very significant is this how to keep the situation from um, destabilizing and and uh, tensions from rising while um, you know the refugees are still you know, waiting for, um, you know, the, the day when they feel confident that they can return. And, and when we were speaking uh, pre this briefing, you were talking about some of the, I, I think, quite unique projects that UNHCR is working on with the sort of local population and the refugee population. And you yourself went out to talk to a number of the mayors and the local municipalities about what were their needs and, and how UNHCR could support that. Can you talk about some of those projects? Yes, I remember when I arrived first in January 2017, just a few weeks after, I went to see some of the mayors in some of the, the, the very major um, refugee hosting municipalities in the Becca. And one of the first things they said to me, you know, several mayors said the same, is can UNHCR support us establish more cemeteries? graveyards because people are starting to get at each other's throats to, to fight over places to bury their dead, their deceased family members because the cemeteries are full. And I remember this really, you know, stayed with me because when it gets to that level, it's really the most kind of inner dignity that is affected. And, and I think it is remarkable that despite all the crisis upon crisis and compounding challenges that hospitality has still you know stayed as long as it has but that's why it's so important that you know we we continue standing with lebanon and supporting lebanon so that you know we cannot take this for granted and um, and also you know many have described how the pressure on waste collection for example with just an addition such an additional large population or on services so you know a, a big part of our, our job is to also mitigate that impact on host communities so that the presence of refugees does not become a source of tensions because you know the Lebanese population sees that you know it's the situation is getting worse for them. Mm -hmm. and Carolina as, as you may know, uh, Australian donors through Australia for UNHCR have been incredibly generous um, supporting UNHCR's operations around COVID preparation and, and prevention and, and treatment in, in, in Lebanon. Can you talk about UNHCR's operations uh, uh, around preparation for in the context of the COVID uh, situation? Yes. Um, so when COVID broke out in, in Lebanon, um, 
the, the, there was a national COVID response plan developed and UNHCR you know, immediately said we, we would contribute to this to ensure that you know, refugees in need of testing, treatment, isolation would receive that and that it would, uh, the, the, we would not have any um, competition for care because what, there was a worry that COVID would spread very quickly in refugee dense areas, um, like there are some informal tented settlements in parts of the country. So, and, and it was expressed that, you know, if uh, you have uh, the hospital beds are full with, with refugees who have tested positive and Lebanese cannot take, get the care. I mean, you can imagine this would be really fuel tensions and anger and, and resentment. Mm -hmm. So we said we would be engaged in three main areas, prevention through raising awareness among the refugee community about, um, you know, hygiene and social distancing. And we did a lot of uh, soap and, and cleaning material distribution. The second was containment. So supporting the establishment of a number of isolation facilities around the country where people who live in very you know, small apartments or homes can, a family member can isolate if she cannot isolate in her home because it's too overcrowded. And thirdly, uh, treatment and hospital care. So we've been supporting um, uh, the expansion of six public hospitals around the country with additional hospital beds and intensive care units. And all of this has been possible thanks to, to the generous support from Australia and other donors. And I think on the COVID response, it's been so appreciated because so far we have not had a situation where it's been felt that refugees are um, taking care from Lebanese and I mean, but of course with the now when COVID has increased quite a lot in the last month, um, there is a worry across the country that hospital capacity may be, you know, reaching its limit soon. Mm -hmm. So the COVID, just to say the COVID response continues to be a top priority for us. Yes, thank you. And, and Carolina, um, we, we spoke about the, the situation in, in, in Lebanon and crisis upon crisis. Um, and then I think everybody felt uh, overwhelmed on that day when the explosion happened. And I remember just watching the news and seeing that explosion. And I have to say, I personally felt so upset and emotional of, uh, uh, about it and it was so dramatic you were actually in beirut uh, with colleagues on there i understand a, a a number of unhcr staff as of as of course both refugees and population live were living in in that area and have been affected what was that day what do you remember from that day now i mean the the it was very it was overwhelming and i think what was also um exceptional in this situation is that um, it was a crisis where also the humanitarian workers were themselves directly affected. I mean, otherwise you have a crisis and you have humanitarian workers coming there to support, you know, ready. But here you had the humanitarian workers with their own homes destroyed, with their own family members injured, with themselves having to on that night seek hospital care to get, you know, stitches or, or pieces of glass removed, you know, while we were, while on the next day it was responding then to yet another emergency on top of the Syria crisis response and the COVID response. Now you have the blast response and underlying all of this, the very deep economic crisis affecting, you know, everything almost. Mm -hmm. So that was very exceptional. So I think, I mean, the, the colleagues, um, were incredible in, uh, you know, just, uh, you know, standing with Lebanon and, and supporting from the beginning. But it was a difficult time. And I think the, the emotional impact um, is still very much there. And that, that will remain for a long time. And, and just on that, you know, because it is crisis upon crisis, well, and, and we know from conflict situations that the health, the education system, the public services all are demolished. What is the health system like in, in, in Lebanon? Some questions are coming in around that and what are the needs? Mm. So there were several, I mean, numerous hospitals that were damaged or destroyed in the blast. 
And this is all happening at a situation, in a situation where you have COVID, I mean, which also makes it very exceptional. So the needs are, are very big. I mean, both in terms of just having the, um, the facilities, the equipment, the medical personnel, um, and that can both be, have the capacity to receive and treat COVID patients and then people who were um, you know, injured in the blast and the regular healthcare. So I think what we have seen from the, you know, if I take from the refugee community is during the past months and, and year that um, the, uh, one of the consequences of the economic crisis and COVID is also that people are refraining from seeking medical care for you know, other conditions that they would normally do, either because they don't have money to pay their share of the, the cost, or because they are worried that they could maybe contract COVID if they go to a hospital, or because you know, the facilities, uh, the services are, are not, don't have the capacity to receive them in their area. And this of course is, is very serious because I mean, public health is a fundamental part of our, you know, um, our well-being and... Uh... and. And one of the things I think, again, when you think of that sort of impact of the explosion, but that one incident, um, you know, I think we've discussed it here as somehow the sort of straw that, that has tipped over where people's mm -hmm. lives were on the tipping point anyway, mm -hmm. now with this impact, not just even if they were physically impacted, but the impact of having the port blown up and distribution mm -hmm. of goods and, and services. And I think for the first time you're seeing now Lebanese seeking to leave by boat, not just mm -hmm. uh, refugees. Mm -hmm. and, and again, that was quite shocking when I learned about that. Can you tell us about what's happening right now there? Yeah, so I mean, over the past year, I mean, due to the economic crisis and also the, you know, this overall compounding situation in the country, we've seen an increase in Lebanese leaving, trying to leave the country to seek, you know, jobs and opportunities abroad. But what is um, exceptional is, like you mentioned, that we've seen a number of Lebanese get on very rickety boats. Uh, to irregularly depart from Lebanon towards Cyprus to seek admission there. Mm -hmm. And we've had these boat movements uh, or attempted boat movements from Lebanon to Cyprus over the years, but you know, in smaller numbers, a few hundred every year, but then it's been the absolute majority Syrians or Palestinian, uh, but that Lebanese joined this now um, is something new. And that has attracted a lot of attention is, and it's just, such a stark illustration of the desperation because these are desperate journeys. I mean, there was one boat with 36 people um, and one woman who had died uh, that was rescued by, by uh, Unifil on the seas after seven days under the scorching sun and without water and without food. So you can imagine, I mean, the state of people, they were in a very, very poor state and extremely traumatized. Mm -hmm. and, and to embark on such a journey tells mm -hmm. you a lot about the desperation and that people see no option and you're really trying to, mm -hmm. to, to, to find like how, how, how to survive. Yes, and I think you were also a, a, exactly that situation and you also had a story about a couple with children and they're yeah. just like one of many presenting to you an HCR office saying, mm. help us, so yes. Yes, we have it, almost every day we have protests outside our office from refugees saying, get us out of here or, you know, please help because we can no longer pay our rent, we can't buy one meal a day for our family. We can't uh, bring our child to hospital because we can't pay the, the expenses. I mean, and we had, yes, indeed one couple who abandoned their four children at our reception center and said, we can't take care of them anymore. You have to help us. And we have had several self-harm attempts. And this of course is also very difficult for the staff, for the frontliners who are receiving people. We had a man who, you know, who cut his, cut himself the other day and 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 this is in front of staff who are trying to counsel and trying to find mm -hmm. you know a solution to the situation but i mean the overall 
situation is that the needs by far exceed the collective resources we have right now because the needs have grown so exponentially over the past year mm -hmm. due to these crisis upon mm -hmm. crisis. So mm -hmm. we're trying, you know, using all resources we have to support, but it's just that the needs are um, deeper and wider. Yes, thank you. Thanks, Caroline. I, I, I've got some more questions, but we'll come back to those at the end. I'd like to come to you now, Brett. Um, and as I said in our, I'm not sure if I revealed you were an Australian. You were very quiet in the introduction. We didn't hear, hear that accent. Uh, but Vic Bride Training is an Australian architect um, who's worked in more than 20 countries across Africa, Asia and the Middle East over the past 20 years. His official title, he's UNHCR's Chief of Shelter and Settlements, a fascinating and very important job within UNHCR, uh, which also makes him a global leader in recovery efforts after disaster and, and conflict. And we've heard a lot from Carolina about the devastating situation and the disaster. But I think um, the importance of your work in rebuilding, literally rebuilding um, uh, what you can and supporting the population uh, uh, around shelter, um, I know we all have a lot of interest. Uh, when you, you arrived in Beirut a, a week after the um, explosion, was this an unusual situation? You've worked in many situations before, but how different was it to, to other situations you found yourself in, Brett? Mm. No, thanks, Naomi. Thank you for the introduction. Um, when I first arrived, I mean, immediately after I arrived, um, I, I was able within an hour or so to walk around the port and the affected area there, kind of through Carantina. And um, what I noticed was really just the sheer volume of the damage. I mean, we, you know, we, we um, work in conflict related displacement. So of course, we've had many years working in different countries around those issues and, and a lot of um, camp populations. But whenever you're working in urban areas, it's really quite complicated because you have these dense multi-storey situations, with very different kinds of buildings, very different kinds of usage, residential, business, commercial, offices, etc. So that's typically what you also find here in the very centre of Beirut as well. Um, as we all know, the blast, you know, happened in the port area, but right immediately beside the port area are some really low-income neighbourhoods, Carantina, and then not far away you get into what is more the, um, I suppose, the popular centre of Beirut, neighbourhoods like Mar Mikhail and Jamezi, where it's really a mixture of very interesting old, some Ottoman buildings, um, some French mandate buildings, modern buildings, small little bars, restaurants, older shops. So you've got this very, very mixed situation. Amongst all that, you have pockets of refugees, but also, you know, a lot of uh, low income um, Lebanese themselves who are really struggling. And for the same reasons that Carolina just mentioned earlier, that there's been over 12 months now of a severe economic decline, there's been COVID, COVID has affected the situation here, similarly to many other countries, but of course, Lebanon really started from a lower base. We had a lot more um, social and economic hardship that was already going on, and then COVID came in and just really hit that again, and then the blast. So amongst all that, you had a mixture of what I would say is um, low quality building stock in the area directly around the port, say Carantina predominantly. Um, and what you normally find in neighborhoods all around the world is that often the poorest of the poor live in the lowest quality housing. And that lowest quality housing was also subject to the most devastating effects of the blast. So you have this kind of domino effect really. Mm -hmm. So we saw that and also I was, quite struck. I mean, parts of Beirut, if you look at a segment of the skyline, it wouldn't look that different from parts of Sydney or parts of Melbourne. You've got 30, 40 storey modern apartment blocks and you look up and all the windows are blown out, balconies blown off, building material hanging and swaying precariously. So there was a lot of damage on the street. But what I was absolutely amazed with was, was the civil society response. I mean, people always talk about resilient populations. It's a phrase that you commonly hear, but 
in, in Lebanon and in Beirut, we had um, thousands, maybe even tens of thousands of people that just spontaneously started responding, sweeping, clearing debris, clearing the streets. Some streets you had dozens of buildings collapsed. You couldn't drive at all. I mean, you could barely walk through, uh, but people were cleaning up. They were moving moving the rubble away, allowing um, access of vehicles and so forth. The immediate, um, say, triage phase and the health, the real health response of the first few days was kind of passed by the time I arrived, but there were still emergency field hospitals set up by um, charities, by Medicine Sans Frontieres and others. So there was still um, some acute issues, but then you could just look around and see these complicated, multi-storied disaster in front of you. And you thought, okay, how, how do we start? Who are we going to help? How are we going to help them? How do we even find them? How do we identify them? So those, those issues come to mind. Um, you know, for me, I'd worked in both natural disaster and conflict. I was in Syria a couple of years ago in Damascus, around Damascus, Eastern Ghouta, that area. And, um, but before that, you know, originally in the beginning, I'd worked in East Timor after the conflict with Indonesia and, um, you know, Sri Lanka, Nepal. So I was used to damage, but this was a very different kind of damage because you had high density urban area, which is a very specific challenge. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so what's, what's, what's your role at the moment and what's the work that UNHCR is engaged in? Right. I mean, one, I guess, fortunate thing in terms of the capacity of not just UNHCR, but all the partner agencies is, um, as we've been discussing, there's kind of crisis upon crisis and um, a, a large um, refugee population. So there was already a mechanism in place to respond to, um, respond to, to crisis. So really within, the, the, within 24 hours, um, UNHCR mobilised and they already had a, you know, large material stocks. A lot of it was ready for, for winter. So we have a large amount of pre-positioned emergency relief items on hand. So they were immediately accessed, disseminated through partners. And within probably about three weeks, we disseminated about 7,500 emergency shelter kits to the most um, immediately affected neighbourhoods around the blast. We call it the three kilometre radius around the blast affected area. So that wasn't a repairs process, but that was really um, just keeping people safe, secure, uh, weatherproofing. So plastic sheeting, plywood, timber, to keep people, um, keep their apartments secure, keep the belongings safe, because there was still some risk at that point. You know, people didn't really know what was happening. Um, so I'm, I've come in basically to support the, the shelter response side, but also support on the coordination because UNHCR as um, one of the global lead agencies on the, on the shelter program, um, we have the responsibility for responding in this situation and coordinating partners. So mm -hmm. I support on the coordination with other agencies, linking out to communities, um, the local government, private sector who have been a huge responder here, um, and then on the actual UNHCR implementation mm -hmm. of the work itself. Mm -hmm. and, and, and in our, in our um, conversations around this, I think I was really impressed. It's not just the emergency response and the immediate needs and, of course, the plastic sheeting, but, but looking how you rehabilitate those neighbourhoods in a sympathetic way. And as you've said, they've sort of, around the port areas, I understand, very mixed areas, lower income, tourist areas, you know, mm. um, so a lot of heritage buildings. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and I think people would be surprised that that's all taken into account in, in looking at what kind of support and reconstruction happens. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's, it's a very different situation here and we have uh, an obligation to what we say, build back better. And that is not just do the most minimum repair process, but take into account you know, the architectural um, heritage, the cultural heritage of the, of the area that we're working in. And I, I don't mean necessarily large, significant UNESCO listed buildings, but, you know, the smaller details, you know, that you'd find along the streetscape. So we work kind of in three levels. One is at the apartment level and we've identified, you know, 
50,000 or so damaged apartments um, across the whole, for all the partners to work in. Uh, you and Heath Shower themselves, ourselves, are working in um, 2,680 apartments. So we, we can classify them, minor repairs, and then rehabilitation, which is a bit more complicated. So anything under $1,500, we call a minor repair. Anything under $4,500, we call a rehabilitation. Then we have the third damage uh, category, which is structural damage. Now, that's, this is complicated work because, of course, every building in the city is different and every apartment in the, in the city is different. They're not, not all alike. And the effects of the blast itself really manifested in different ways as the shockwave kind of hit the city and then bounced through the street and, and across the, you know, the, the landscape and the built environment. So you had this very, very differing effect um, and it largely destroyed um, at the most minimum level, I would say nearly all the buildings, every building had some kind of damage, either the windows blown out, doors blown out, some sustained a lot more, as I mentioned, that second level of damage where you had, you know, the suspended ceiling ripped down or other kinds of, let's say still superficial, but then you had others that were structurally damaged with the unsafe to live in, um, buildings partially collapsed, columns destroyed, beams, this kind of thing. So there's a, a varying degree of damage that we've got to categorize, um, approach in different ways. So I think that that's been really interesting. Um, very complicated. We work mostly all through the partners, but also through contractors, because the um, construction system in Lebanon is sophisticated. Um, there's a lot of capacity here, but, it, but we have to take into account issues of inflation. There's been rampant inflation. Immediately after the blast, building materials went up by between 22 and 25%. Now they're normalized back to around between 11 and 13% inflation. The currency value is going up and down, down mostly. Um, and just the sheer volume of material required means it needs to be imported from the region and so many countries in such a magnitude, it places a lot of stress on what we call the whole kind of housing supply value chain. So there's a lot on that. We're really also worried and concerned about the most vulnerable people, um, the elderly and others who, or who have been living in low quality housing. How do we help them? Um, for those listeners, um, supporters online, they, they may know about the kind of rental system here. You have what we refer to as old rent and then the newer rent. So old rent are people that have leases under an old regime and they're, they're um, relatively cheap, but they're also often, it often means there hasn't been any incentive for the apartment owner to, to maintain the apartments in any way. So that they're quite decrepit. Um, and then the people that are in that situation are often low income. So there's a big challenge there. So we're doing a lot to prevent evictions, to get public information out there. So we call that HLP, Housing, Land and Property Approaches. So it isn't just a construction activity. There's a whole social agenda around it, um, of the building and the, the neighbourhood around to make it safe, to make it better. So it's a, an interesting and varied program we've got going here. Yeah, thank you. And and I wanted to talk about, um, uh, and, and you've been involved in um, winterisation um, uh, preparation, I'm sure, over a number of years, and you would have seen that in Syria and whatever. I think it's sometimes hard to appreciate from Australia. You think as countries like Lebanon is really, really hot, but in fact, sometimes they are like Australia, but they also have, you know, and it's coming now, very severe, severe winter. What kind of preparations are in place for uh, the refugee population in, in mm -hmm. Lebanon in the lead up to, to winter now? Yeah. I mean, we're going full steam ahead to try to um, repair and rehabilitate all the damaged apartments that we've targeted. So that is a massive effort on a daily basis. Um, and we've got you know, through the partner organisations, hundreds and hundreds of people dedicated to that. And civil society as well, citizens, businesses, um, groups of friends and family and um, religious communities, church groups, all kinds of groups are coming together and they're concentrating on that. So I think that there's a broad collective effort that we're supporting. Um, but of course, 
we can't do everything within such a short amount of time. So you have to have a plan B and probably even a plan C as well. Um, the plan B is that we've still got our emergency stocks to make sure that the priority is keeping people safe, dry and warm in the bitterly cold weather. Um, luckily, Beirut doesn't suffer from that as much as other parts of the country where you know you can get a lot of snow. Um, but so we've got that approach as well. And then of course, rental support. So for those people that are living, say, in the third category of um, buildings that I mentioned, the structurally damaged ones, we have a rental support where people, um, we, we, we help them to find alternative accommodation and get, then give them rental support so that they're, they're economically possible uh, to pay the rent. In other parts of the country, you know, we do have a lot of Syrian refugees living in really poor conditions. Um, plastic, you know, plastic sheeting, um, uh, re semi-renovated garages, no heating, no running water, shared bathroom facilities, uh, and that can, can get pretty desperate when it's very, very cold. Similar situation across the region, northwest Syria and elsewhere as well. So it is a huge annual effort, the winterization approach. Um, people are familiar with it, but here this year, of course, we have this amazing, horrible, unpredicted effect of COVID-19, which affects every country different, differently, but it means, you know, like, like every person wants to help themselves and wants to meet their own needs. And people don't like relying on humanitarian aid. They don't like what it does to them emotionally or personally. And to seek aid, I think is tough. It's tough for everyone. I mean, Lebanese families here who were otherwise um, middle income, people who are teachers, nurses, um, they're now asking for food and asking for income support and things like that. And they, they are they're feeling shamed to do so. So providing humanitarian aid with dignity is really important because you have to meet people as equals. And I think that uh, that's what we always strive to do. Thank you, Brett. And that's actually a great segue to Raja because I see you nodding there, Raja, with everything that Brett is saying about providing humanitarian support with dignity, you know, profile of Lebanese, you know, teachers, you know, doctors, you know, who, whoever. And I know you've got quite an extended family in, in, in Lebanon. What are you hearing back from your relatives about the situation there? Well, hello, everybody. Um, listening in, I have to say I've been nodding the whole time because it's absolutely everything that we know that's happening in Lebanon. It is a dire situation. Um, we are talking, uh, you know, catastrophe after catastrophe. And in Arabic, we say pain upon pain. And uh, in Lebanon at the moment, uh, all of that has come together and has really weakened uh, the positivity that the Lebanese usually have. And uh, the question they're asking themselves is, how much more can we actually take? And, uh, the stories aren't pretty. Um, they are trying to get on with their life, um, but with the dire situation, whether it's politically, uh, economically, um, it, is, it is a struggle and it's gonna take some time for the Lebanese who I know to be resilient people uh, to actually recover from this. It's gonna be, a, I would say, an entire generation. Um, and this is what we're hearing from our family. Mm -mm. And and your your own parents came out, I think, in the seventies, uh, Raja, like many Lebanese migrants at at, at the time. And uh, Australia, of course, is a much richer place uh, because of their their contribution. But the impact on the the community here, people must be feeling it um, very very closely. What kind of response? And I know you can't speak for all; it's a diverse community. It is. But I know I know you have um, many many networks. How's the community responded uh, to this latest situation and crisis? Well, look, I have to say we knew COVID uh, was was rampant, and uh, it took a while for the Lebanese community to accept that it was true when it was happening. Um, 
but and 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 with all the protests and the political unrest we 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 already knew Lebanon was in a dire situation um but I think the Lebanese here once we saw that blast or anybody over the world that saw that blast uh, it I, I, the only way I can describe it is collective trauma and um and and um sadness uh, we are we have always been waiting for a peaceful Lebanon uh, we want to go back and, and learn about our ancestry. Uh, but it was always, the unrest was always there. But once that war was blown up, it, it really, um, it put us all in a state of shock, let's say. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter what religion or what sect or what political party you followed, I think the blast was the last straw where we, the Lebanese, started to look at each other and saying, how are we going to change this? It cannot keep going like this. Mm -hmm. um, so. and, and, and Raja, on that, we've actually had sort of some questions coming through. And if we've got time, I might sort of um, also refer them back to, to Carolina and Brett. But exactly, you know, how do you see a sort of hopeful way forward in, in, in Lebanon? Well... Or do you? Uh, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Look, my name Raja means hope, so I'm going to always be <laughs> hopeful um, that the situation will change. And look, I, I was super, I was planning on visiting Lebanon uh, last year. It was a pilgrimage I've been waiting to do with my family for a very long time. Um, and the one thing that's coming out of Lebanon is youth and, and uh, not so much the elite, but the average Lebanese person is stepping up and saying, we've had enough. We need a system change. We need our country to come to us, to at least prove to us that there is going to be a future, that there will be hope. The Lebanese are resilient. I, um, I love the culture so much. I'm very Australian, but I have maintained a lot of those Lebanese characteristics. And the Lebanese have a saying that, that something along the lines that, you know, we might fall today, but we're going to stand tomorrow. And um, I'm hopeful with the voices that are coming out from the youth in Lebanon, is saying that we are going to make a change. And we see that going right across the Middle East. Um, my hope as to how they're going to get out of this is to hold people to account. If you are going to run a country, you need to run it well. And you need to take everybody along with you um, and to ensure that everybody's voice is heard. Um, I am hopeful. We've seen Lebanon here before, maybe not as many issues, um, but uh, I always, I love the poetry of Lebanon and I always go back to Khalil Gibran and he, in his poetry, he's always speaking about hope and to have a look at yourself and have a good laugh and you know, be a little bit critical. And, um, and in his poem, in one of them, he says, the most massive characters are seared with scars. Mm -hmm. And we know that of Lebanon. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I know, Raja, you're also passionate about um, education um, uh, and both sort of supporting, you know, people in Lebanon, but also here in, in the Australian community through your work, both as the Crescent Foundation ambassador uh, but also wearing one of your many hats as a teacher so for, for a number of years at Holroyd High. For those sort of joining us, Holroyd High is a, um, uh, a secondary school in Sydney's um, uh, western suburbs with a very um, large population of students from refugee and, and, and migrant backgrounds. I think over 113 or something like that uh, nationalities there, which is extraordinary. And uh, Raja was responsible uh, for really a, a groundbreaking program working with the, the local community. Just a few minutes to talk about that because it is so inspirational. Thank you. Um, well, Naomi, the, uh, the story of the refugees is not very far from my own experience. I, I know this story. My parents came to Australia in the mid uh, 70s with one suitcase and had to start all over again. They knew very well in Lebanon that the chances of educating all their children uh, was very minimal. 
and uh, and so they took well they had the courage to to pack and leave and they got on a boat and they went to Cyprus and my mum was actually heavily pregnant with me um, and they made the journey to Australia um, and they made me hope you know the hope for something new the hope for a better way of life, the hope to retain some connection to history and family, but to also look forward to developing an Australian identity. And, um, and so in, in saying that, I mean, I've, I've always been very passionate about education and, and I know it just transforms, it transforms the individual, but it transforms families and, and communities. And in Australia, getting a chance at education is, is pretty good. And, and so with my, my teaching over the years, I could see the struggles that, that some of these families would experience. And I thought, if I really want to be a passionate teacher, I've got to think outside of the square. Um, I love teaching social science, but what good is that if the other side doesn't actually understand what I'm teaching? Um, but at the same time, uh, we, we take the kids and we, we empower them and, and we put them through an excellent education system but I thought who was left behind were the parents. Um, and so uh, I'm, basically we, uh, the school that I was at had a very progressive principal that said, yep, go ahead, try something new. Let's see what we can do to try and get more parent engagement. And uh, myself and, and a team put together a program of uh, parent engagement. In, a, in fact, our parents also became students and uh, we wanted to ensure that both the, 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 the kids and the parents were still on the same page. And we wanted to empower them with English conversation lessons. We wanted to let them know what the education system looks like here in Australia and how they too can benefit from it. For me, I also wanted to ensure that, you know, self-care and, and, and caring for themselves whilst this transition was happening was paramount, particularly with the mums. And so we did our best to try to get them out and about, to try and get them to integrate into wider society, you know, doing crash courses on being Australian. I mean, I don't know if I'm the best person for that, but we tried. Um, and, and just trying to help them find work and just to find a connection with the people that have come before them and saying, you know, it's going to be okay. We're going to try and help you. The transition period doesn't have to, has to be as long as what it was with our parents uh, because the model is there. We understand. What we're going to do is we're going to distract you in the meantime to try and get you over this hard phase. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Now, I've just, um, in the time left, I'm just getting some questions in from um, people who have joined us. And look, we've heard from, from all of you, I guess, about that tremendous Lebanese spirit and particularly the examples around the explosion when the sort of local community were the first responders and came together spontaneously and through WhatsApp groups to, you, you know, help um, clear the debris and, and help victims of, of, the, um, of the disaster. But hand in hand with that, you know, a sort of... Um, you know, non-existent, you know, or, or very fragile um, uh, national government and, and, and security. What is security like for people now in, in Beirut and, and Lebanon um, uh, in the aftermath of, of the explosion? Maybe Carolina, I'll start with you and Brett throw in. Thank you very much. No, I mean, that, that is still there. I mean, people really supporting each other. And, and I, but I think what has also very much been revealed is the absence of a social protection system and a social safety net mm -hmm. and that people are relying and, and dependent on the support from their families and from their communities. Mm -hmm. So, it's wonderful that people are showing each other this support, but it's a situation when, when everyone is impacted, um, you know, or, or largely everyone is impacted by these crises upon crisis. It's also very important that a social protection system is developed. And that is part of, I mean, the way to recovery, to really try and um, get the economy to recover so jobs can be created, so people can have, 
you know, fend for themselves and not be dependent on humanitarian aid or assistance, which as, as Brett said, you know, it's not dignified and, 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 and people don't want to, people want to manage on their own. So I think it is still there, people are with each other, but there is also a strong call for, you know, a safety net to be developed. Mm -mm -mm. And and we've touched on it, but you know, after nine years, you know, with a sort of very generous local population, but you know, now under severe stress it, it, itself, how do you see that that playing out? Um, not only in Lebanon, but other countries who are hosting large number of refugees. And as we know, it's often the uh, poorest countries that that take that responsibility and have the largest numbers of, of refugees that they're supporting. What do you see happening, uh, Carolina, um, in 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 Lebanon? You know, to to support um, that. Well, I, I see a lot of commitment to continue standing with Lebanon. That I think there is a huge recognition that you know we have to work together to keep Lebanon from you know becoming further fragilized and 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 social cohesion from disintegrating because that can affect the, the stability in in a very fundamental way. But um, and, and, and I very much believe it is possible. I think it is possible. The ingredients to reverse this um, economic, you know, downward spiral are there, but you need to cook, cook the soup in the right way. So it is really with, you know, the economic uh, recovery that will enable jobs to be created. People can go back to working. Um, you know, taking care of themselves, reduce the dependency on assistance, while in the meantime also scaling up the support to people. There is really a need to now scale up the, the humanitarian and social assistance to refugees, to Lebanese, to prevent people from feeling, you know, again, forced to, to fight over the same job just for survival, not because they want to fight, not because they hate each other, but because they just need to prevent themselves from, from, from dying of hunger. Mm -hmm. and, and that's how serious the situation has gone. So this is really the time to stand with Lebanon and, and be there because it's, um, it's also, it's for now, people's survival now, but also for the future. And like Raja said, for the children's, for families to feel that they have the capacity to keep their children in school instead mm -hmm. of taking them out to work on a farm for mm -hmm. a few uh, Lebanese pounds, you know, per day. Mm -hmm. And um, in, again, in the last minute, if there were just uh, two or three things that you would say to our supporters and donors in, in Australia, what would they be, Carolina? Well, first, a huge thank you, because the support that you are providing saves lives. It's not only about, you know, adding, you know, things on top of it. It's, it's really life saving at this moment because you know, we are soon getting the, the, the new data from our vulnerability assessment of Syrian refugees and estimate that well over 80% will be below the extreme poverty line now because of all these crises. So I think to really continue standing with Lebanon, it's a protracted refugee situation. It's not always in the media or in the spotlight because there are new crises. But as the years go by, the the situation, you know, has has worsened, and now is the time to continue standing with Lebanon. So, I think that, and then just the last to say, resettlement, resettlement to Australia is also key. It's a solution that is unfortunately only available for a small number, but we always advocate for more places because that also saves lives and gives people, you know, an ability to plan for for a different future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Carolina. Sadly, I've run out of run, run out of time. So many questions and 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 so much interest. Uh, but I really want to thank you three for your time, Raja, Brett, and, and Carolina. 
as if you've seen the messages sort of streaming over our, our, our chat line, you know, so many supporters saying thank you, that's been so informative, you know, the information, um, the encouragement that, that you were there standing there for, for, for Lebanon. So thank you so much. I want to, of course, thank also all our supporters around Australia for joining us again for our Australia for UNHCR Frontline Club. Your support has been crucial in responding, not only to the uh, aftermath of the explosion in, in Beirut, but supporting UNHCR's humanitarian operations, which we've heard have been, you know, over uh, many decades now. And also, as we've heard from Brett, uh, the need to support UNHCR's uh, preparations for winter in Lebanon, supporting refugees and, and the host communities. Um, the challenges will continue, but I know our teams led by our wonderful guests today and our great advocate Raja in our community here. Um, you're all absolutely committed to doing everything uh, that you can with us to support refugees and internally displaced people facing the huge challenge, challenges that they do. In times like this, it's really important that we all look out for each other and particularly the most vulnerable uh, amongst us. Thank you to everybody for standing with refugees. And we're just going to close with a, a short video um, featuring one of uh, Carolina's and Brett's colleagues in Beirut, uh, Dalal Haab. Um, so thank you so much. Thanks, Naomi. Thanks, everyone. Here in Beirut, where I live and work, we're still struggling with the aftermath of the devastating August explosions. Everyone was affected, myself included. Lebanon is already suffering from an economic collapse and the COVID-19 consequences. And this tragedy is adding a crisis upon crisis. From day one, your generosity has allowed us to immediately respond to the need of those most affected and hardest hit with shelter and protection. We thank you from the heart for standing with the people of Beirut in their time of need. Please donate if you can. Thank you.